Thanks so much for uh, coming on down tonight. Um, so I'm Alicia, I'm currently at Pivotal. Um, you may remember me from such companies as Amazon Web Services, uh, where I recently spent three years bringing the wonders of infrastructure as a service to organisations. And uh, it's, I've got to say, it's been interesting in the, the last few years where everyone I meet says, oh, we're using Amazon for that. Whereas when I started back in 2011, no one was using Amazon for anything. So things change over time. But I'm here to take you through some of the considerations and things you should thinking about when you're going to microservices. And because like many IT trends that we have, we tend to treat it in a particular way. And it's really getting a bit overexcited about things. It's kind of what we tend to do. We think it's going to solve world hunger, everything's going to be better, everything's going to be amazing. With any technology shift like this, it's just better than every way we've thought of so far. Also remember, you are building the legacy code of the future today. Just get over it. Yeah, that's, what's happening. that's what's happening. That's okay. That's what we have. You know, I, I started back in the day as a COBOL programmer, and there's still code running at one of the major banks that I have my comments on. You know, that's not a good thing. It's a thing. <laughs> Be aware of it. So we don't need to talk much about the definition of microservices because Charles did a tremendous job. But again, the words of Adrian Cockroft, loosely coupled, bounded context. Do not forget loosely coupled, super duper important for scale, for reliability, for everything. We'll talk a lot about that. This is not what we're talking about. And too many people say, isn't it just enterprise service bus all over again? No. Computer says no, because when that sucker in the middle goes down, and it will go down, the world ends. When you try and change things, the middle becomes the problem. What we are talking about is more of a Death Star type view of the world. These are real microservices. This is how they talk to one another. What is missing from this? There is no central point of control. There is no one thing that can break. What's the corollary of that? There is a shit ton of things that can break. <laughs> Absolutely. Now my small brain can't process all the relationships that exist there, but somehow movies keep getting sourced and inane texts get sent to people. So why do we want to embrace this new technology? Because it's the new hotness, because it's cool, because that's what the cool kids are doing? No. It has nothing to do with it. But we'll talk about some of the reasons why it works, and we'll talk about why it is not an inherently superior architecture. It is just another architecture. We'll talk about that we're still building big systems. We'll talk about how Docker's not going to save the world, and this stuff ain't either. None of this stuff is free, but it digs you out some other holes, and that's what we're always looking for. And you cannot forget about the data, and I'll talk a bit about that at the end as well, because there's some hard questions that have to be answered. So, Let's get cracked at that Microservices is not about technology, it's not about refactoring, it's not about developer efficiency, it's about getting stuff into production faster than before. Bottom line. And that's because we want to get closer from idea to value than ever before. That's the point. And quite frankly, that's what your bosses will listen to if you're talking about microservices to them. If you say this would be a really easy way for us to split up our functions within our team, etc., not interested. Don't want to know about it. It's that that gets us to the point. And this is because we want to get customer feedback, improve our system, put it into production, get customer feedback, and so on and so forth. Rinse and repeat. This is why companies like Amazon, like, like Facebook, like LinkedIn, etc., build software that people actually like to use because they change it all the time based on real usage data and real feedback. You can only do that if you can deploy into production. Who here has a great time deploying into production? Who is it really easy? Exactly, Charles, a couple of other guys. Yeah. I met with a customer in Sydney the other day and they were telling me how they deploy into production 18 times a month. And I said, wow, that's really good. And they said, I wish you'd come and tell our bosses that they think it sucks. And I said, I talk to organisations that deploy it once a year. Typically on Easter weekend, when we can get everyone together over the pizza because we know everything's going to go badly. And this is what happens. We have all these little iterative approaches in here, but what have we built here? We've built what a scrum for. Yeah. There's all these little iterative projects that we're tied to this release, we're tied to that release. We can't move very quickly. And this is because we have this in most organisations. It's a very siloed view of delivery where everything has to be requested. And we have to ask for everything all the time. A QA won't let me deploy because it doesn't work. And the DBAs won't make a change to the database because it will affect someone else. God help me if I have to talk to the network guys because they're not going to give me anything ever. Ever. So what do we do? We split these two things up. We basically say, I have a capability team, cross-functional, that can build stuff that matters to people. 
and they can get access to resources that operate on a platform that are easy to access without talking to a human being or filling in a form. And that's why people like cloud, quite frankly, because they don't have to talk to human beings. And as developers, let's face it, we love not talking to them. <laughs> that's why I got into the business in the first place. On the keyboard, headphones on, good to go. Nerd buffer. So what do we have to think about? Well, we, it means that we can now break things up and we can be deploying components from a business perspective much faster. If I need to upgrade something in the catalogue system, I can do it much quicker. I don't have a dependency in the shipping area. Now people say, well, hang on, what if shipping needs something in the catalogue stuff? Well, they can goddamn wait till catalogue gets it done. But when they get it done, they can consume it. And if catalogue knows that shipping is going to need something in the future, they can build it before shipping is ready to consume it and it's just out there in production waiting to be used. It really changes the timing mechanism and gives you much more freedom. So what are we doing here? We're decoupling the change cycle. We're making it very easy to deploy very, very quickly. We're allowing ourselves to own a product tip to tail. We should know everything about it. There's no excuse not to. You're not this monolith anymore. You've got little bits. Know your bits. We build and operate what we understand best. One of the best things they do at Amazon is when you develop services at Amazon, they say, fantastic, you're a developer. Welcome to the club. Here's the pager. You're supporting this stuff. And there's a level three escalation, you're on the hook. You'd be amazed how much better the code gets. You'd be amazed the comments that go in, the tests that get run, it's fantastic. But in all seriousness, if you have to run this stuff, you, look, you care about it. And I get a sense in this room that there's a bit of antipathy against operations folks. Not uncommon between developers and operators. You guys need each other, you work together. The reason why operators don't like developers is because the dead fish gets thrown over the fence and they've got to run with it. The reason why developers don't like operators is because operators are the department of no. No, you can't have the firewall change. No, you can't deploy the system. No, there's not a bigger server. Try and break out of that model. We collaborate through API contracts, not through the database. All the time I see the integrations through the database. It is a disaster. If you see that, run screaming from the hill. We talked about microservice to microservice, but also microservice to platform. The microservice should be able to do things itself that it needs to get done. And do that through an API as well. No human interaction required. <clears throat> so, how do we compose these things together? I want to use a couple of examples. Spring Boot is an open source project you can use. There are many, many others in many languages. You don't need frameworks, as Charles and I were talking about today. But frameworks are your friend when you're stuck with a particular code base or type of coding that requires you to use that. Or well, that's just what you know or what your organization is. So, now, you can do things pretty quickly and pretty small in the right framework. This is a REST interface for, uh, for a Spring Boot. Um, you can put that in a tweak if you want. Um, I don't know how tweaks get into production, but you can figure it out. But even defining REST-based interfaces and defining data structures is very straightforward. And you can just add a few lines of code and a few uh, expositions there. And bingo, bingo, you can make a call and get some data back. It's not hard to do. But, these microservices do not live on their own. They talk to other microservices. And this is where the world of hurt begins. Let's take a really simplified example. I've got a browser, I've got an interface, I've got my customer <coughs> service, I've got my store service. Not the best decomposed one, but it'll do for us. What are we going to think about? Version. Version control. Configuration management. Which version is running where? What is compatible with what? Uh -oh. How do I find these services that are out there? They're just out there. They're micro. They're very hard to find because they're so small. How do I discover them? How do I route traffic to my services? What happens when an instance of the service breaks? Remember the death star we saw at the start? Try figuring out something goes wrong there. How do we tolerate faults? One of the best lessons that I learned at Amazon was from Werner Vogels, and he said, everything is breaking all the time. It just is. If you're in a complicated system and these become complicated systems, something will be breaking. A service will be breaking, a network will be down, a router will be going bung, a storage array dies, a RAM corrupts, whatever. Something's always breaking. As soon as you accept that as your state of being, you build stuff differently. Because you expect things to break and say, when I make this call and I don't get the answer back that I thought I was going to get, what do I do? How do I handle it gracefully? So what do we do? We add things to the architecture. We add things like load balances. We add things like circuit breakers and monitors. We add things like config servers. We add things like service discovery layers. And the nice thing is we don't have to build these from scratch 
because our good friends at Netflix did it for us and open sourced it. Now you may not use this language and structures, but you can use the same concepts and many people have re-platformed these tool sets in other languages to take advantage of. What we've done in Spring, for example, is include a lot of these in Spring as well. So if you're a Java programmer, you can just grab them off the shelf, which makes it nice and easy. So suddenly you have all these components that can make life easier for you. It can mean that when you make a call to a service and it's down, you know how to back off, when to restart. But the service itself can nominate that it's down and something should be happening, some, inter some interfacing these down. None of this is free at all. You've got to pay for your lunch. And this article was an excellent article. Um, if you don't read high scalability, you should. Um, it's a wealth of really interesting knowledge, and it was a really good article talking about why these things aren't all sweetness and and really, there are some things you have to do. This stuff is hard to operate. So we talk about the monolith. Yeah, it's hard to get this big ball of mud into production. But God damn, I managed to do it once. Big one. Now we've got 20, 30, 40, 100, and multiple copies of instances of that. Let's get it. You need to have DevOps skills. You need to be able to move very quickly into production. You need to have interfaces. There's duplication of effort. I'll tell you what, dev managers hate duplication of effort. Why are you building a service with a database and those guys have a service over there? That's one of the biggest arguments you'll have with people. We bought an Oracle database. Why don't you just use that? I don't want to pay three sets of licenses. Oh, it's open source. No, I don't care. Da, 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 da. And that whole conversation. Distributed system complexity. Charles made the point very accurately. Distributed systems are super powerful and unbelievably cool and holy crap, they're hard to do. And really hard to do well. But the bottom line is if you have any system that needs to scale at some point in its life, it's the only way you have to go. You're not going to go by it with a monolith and a, high, and a vertical scaling model. But there's stuff you pay for. Working in an asynchronous world is hard. The monolith does not suffer that. I'm calling components within the monolith. I'm just expecting rammed speeds back. I'm now calling services that could be who knows where. And they may never answer me back. So things come into play. Queuing comes into play all the time. And how do I test this? How do I test the interfaces between all these services? Sounds like it really sucks now, doesn't it? To do microservices, we're going back to models. So the answer is, you have to be this tall to ride the microservices train. You have to have the ability to do rapid provisioning. You have to have a minimum of monitoring. I'd argue advanced monitoring, but let's call it basic. You have to have the ability to deploy your application rapidly, and you have to have a DevOps culture. If you do not part, have these, do not pass code, do not collect two hundred dollars. You are doing a science experiment rather than a business transformation. So that's okay, you may want to do that, but just be aware if you want to make real change. You need to have a platform. Again, pioneers go out there, get the arrows in their backs for us. Netflix discovered this. They built themselves a platform to deploy their code onto it, to make code changes very easy, because they realised they had to have that, because the traditional way of doing it wasn't coming. So we have a platform, funnily enough, Cloud Foundry, um, and this is what we believe is the future of how you would deploy services agnostic and cloud independent way. And really what it's all about is allowing you to provision environments automatically. So as a developer you don't think about it. But the <laughs> operators are happy with how it gets done because it gets done the way they want it done to make it easier. You have on demand and automatic scale. Now it's one thing to say, hey, I'll just deploy this service and I'll just spin it up and it's fine. But well, what happens when it's out of capacity? Like two, four, six. You know, auto scaling is one way that we do that traditionally in the cloud. Let's do it at the service line in a more granular fashion. Failover and resilience, often forgotten, the most important part. All this stuff will break, all the time. If you cannot tolerate that, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Routing and load balancing, again, it sounds easy, I'll just deploy 10 copies of my, 10 instances of my service, well how do I load balance to them? How do I discover them? How do I take them in and out of service? How do I do a uh, AB deployment or a blue green deployment? How do I do this? And finally, monitoring. How do I know that everything's okay? And that no one's just deploying stuff that's not being listened to. So you need to have a platform. You need to have a mechanism to do that. And I wanted to give you an example of what deploying to a platform looks like because we end up building these platforms all the time. And this is what I see over and over with customers is you go into an organization, say, oh, I've hooked together a bit of a chef, and I've got some Jenkins, and I've got this bit and that bit. And they say, who knows how all this works? That guy. Just like guy just left and they were screwed. 
So we want to have a more standard platform. So what happens in a standard platform? We come to deploy an app and we push the app to the platform. And the platform goes out and says, hey, I'm going to upload all my stuff to the platform. I'm going to check with my service broker to see are there any other services I need to consume. So it could be a database service, a queuing service, etc., cetera, no SQL service. And then I'm going to stage the build pack. So I now know what I have to build and what it looks like. And I can stamp them out as many times as I want onto my runtime containers. So what this does is basically abstract away all the complexity of deploying the service very quickly. So from a development standpoint, just saying, hey, I built this, push it out there. I don't want to worry about the detail. What also happens within this mode is that we have these build packs. And the build packs can detect what language you've written your application. So when you push your application, it detects what dependencies are required and gathers them for you. Who here programs in Ruby? How much fun is it getting an environment good to go for Ruby? Oh my god. Yak shaving at its best. It is a nightmare. This takes that yak shaving away and that's what's important. It brings all the components together and just pushes it out there. Uh, wonderful. So what about load balancing and scaling? How does that get handled? Well, we talk about deploying our application. So hey, I've got my application. These DAs down the bottom are the droplet execution agents. They are virtual machines that then have containers running on top of the virtual machines. Container idea is nothing new. We've been doing it since MBS days. We've been doing it since Solaris. We're doing it again. We'd like to reinvent this. So if I run my instance of my service in my container, I'm good to go. And I'm routing that now so I can access that through the router. Fantastic. I didn't have to do anything. When I access my app, it knows where to point. What happens when I need to scale up? Well, I just add another instance. And I need to automatically register so the router knows where to send the data as well. And to talk to that service. And that's load balancing between those components. What about if it breaks? Well, we have the health manager. The health manager has to look after and say, oh, look what just happened. Something just disappeared. Now, as far as the health manager is concerned, this is how the world is looking now. As far as the cloud control is concerned, that's what it should look like. So it needs to make some equilibrium take place. And bring things together again. So it will automatically respin up that instance on another functioning droplet execution agent so it can run and operations can figure out what the hell went wrong with that machine afterwards. Again, this is the swan gracefully across the water while the legs underneath are going bananas. This is about changing the operational model, so all you've got to worry about is getting an application up there, and it works all the time, and anything that breaks gets replaced in a non-disruptive way. What else has to happen? Well, we may have services that don't run on the platform. They run externally on VMs, etc. So this is where the magic of something called Bosch comes into play. And Bosch is written by some, some ex-Googlers who decided they wanted to show how things can be deployed more easily. And it will automatically deploy your services for you. So these are services like databases that have to run on bare metal, for example. They do exist. Queuing services that can't run on the platform, etc. It will go ahead and spin them up for you and get them ready. So he's, for example, doing Cassandra. Create them on the nodes and register them with the system. So then when I come on and I say, hey, I'm going to create my service, I can actually have it registered automatically. And it will send me back my credentials and make sure everything's ready for me to go. So I'm no longer setting up YAML files or sending data across, etc. It is all binding automatically. Again, make it easy for you. Yeah. So it's about what doesn't happen rather than what does happen. Another issue we often talk about is logging. All developers forget about logging. When you're a developer that becomes a devop and you're carrying the pager, you care a lot You love logging. What's the biggest problem that you have with logs? When the timestamps don't match and you can't correlate anything in the environment. So the idea here is to say, let's get it all together, have it synchronized, have it automatically tooled up so that we pump out the logs into some location. It can be wherever you want it to go. It can be into Splunk, it can be into whatever online tool you like, but you've got to have a common view of all your logs so you can see what's happening all the time. And again, the platform should take care of that for you. You should have to think about that. So, enough platform talk. What about the data? This is the elephant in the room. This 
Doesn't work. One ring to rule them all. I hate people talking about this all the time. This is the, we have a single source of truth discussion. Or we have one big scalable database. Or we have one common data model that we all use. This will break you. This will be the cause of all your nightmares. This is what brings down giant powerhouse organisations, is this architecture. Every large scale internet organisation started that way. Amazon started that way. Twitter started that way. They all went through the pain of decoupling and breaking out of that. In fact, the scaling stories of Twitter are legendary, well publicised. But this is a bad one. So the model we talk about is this one, where each service is responsible for its own storage and its own data representation, and you don't care what it is. Could be Mongo, could be Cassandra, could be the new coolness, could be flat files, it could be a bag of monkeys. Doesn't matter, should matter, don't need to know that. And what this means is that we often will have overlapping pieces of information. Because you know what? There is no single source of truth. And I'll tell you now, there are some people within the business who you'll tell that to and they'll want to punch you in the face. But it's true. Because everyone has perspective. And there are many stories from consulting where people have gone in and said, you know, airlines for example, what does a booking mean to you? This part of the business, that part of the business, that... And they get 14 different answers. There is no single source of truth. It is a case of perspective. So we try and provide the best perspective for people and there may be some commonality and some duplication. But it's okay. It's a bit of relaxation that has to take place. This also opens us up to polyglot persistence. That sounds cool, doesn't it? Because we can choose whatever we want to use. Now, this is, again, a big fear of many people who work in uh, engineering from an executive perspective or do reliability engineering, etc. Because they say, oh my god, now I've got a whole lot of technologies I have to support. Before I only had to worry about SQL Server. Now I've got SQL Server, MongoDB, Cassandra, and DynamoDB. How am I going to hire for that? It's an interesting challenge, and I don't think there is a good answer for it. It's a real, it depends. Some organisations will tolerate this model really well, others will tolerate it less well. It's a decision only you can make. But you need to think about it because someone's going to call you on it at some point. When you say, I want to use the next best thing, they'll say, that's fantastic, but when you guys leave, I have no one else on the team who knows how this works. Not so hard with flat files, but databases can cause you an issue. Also, don't be tempted to do this little trick. See how here, everything's fine. You know, REST interfaces and queues. Oh, here, I've just gone. I'll just tap into the database of that other service directly. They won't mind. <laughs> Bum -bum. Death happens there. Do not do that. Again, it's only through the front door, only through the API. Everything else should be able to change. So, this model seems wonderful. Because it's solved a whole lot of our problems and we don't have the shared data model, etc. But um, what's the reason why we put everything into one big database? What do you think the reason is? Convenience? Cost? Scale? It's so we can report on that data easily. That's why most people do it. Because they're going to want to not just have operational data, but be able to report on that data. I've got to give the quarterly sales reports, I've got to have the velocity fees. What's my inventory report? Well, I'll just go and write some SQL on my centralised database, do a few clever joins, I've got my answer. Well, guess what's not going to happen in that model? You don't query anything, eh? You're pretty much screwed. And I'm going to answer this problem. Jeez. So, what we can lean on are a few different patterns. There's no one right answer to any of this, but I'm just giving you some ideas. So, one approach is what's called the Lambda architecture. And the Lambda architecture is a big data approach where we combine both batch processing, real-time processing, and streaming processing. And it's a very interesting domain. I don't have time to explain it in depth today. But what you need to know is basically what we're saying is all of these services should be publishing events about what's happening in their world. And those events then go into that Lambda architecture, for example, and that becomes your representation source to query upon. So we're now separating the job of systems that are potentially doing transactional work to those that need to be doing query type work. And we know they are incompatible workloads, are they not? particularly in the data model world. So we separate them, but we again are loosely coupling, there's our big friend Rabbit and Q in there, loosely coupling those relationships. So you can be changing this as much as you want. This side also is very tolerant of change. Because we're not saying throw it into a static data warehouse, we're saying throw it into a more open platform. Typically this is deployed in 
some sort of Hadoop structure, and then we use very uh, schema on read type technology rather than schema on write technology. Um, moving data around can be hard. Spring XD is something that would be worth your while to look at because it actually makes that very, very easy to do. But I wanted to give you an example just to work this through. Because Spring XD lets us do some fun stuff. So this is a, a company in the US called Redbox, which is similar to our UV guys, the Hoyts ones. You know, maybe you get physical media. That's an interesting data model. So in this world, this is what kind of what happens is that as a user, you would go online. This is before streaming in Australia and all that good stuff. But you'd go online and say, hey, I want this movie. And it would say, let me find one for you. And it would figure out the, uh, the inventory for you to tell you where to go. You go, you pick it up and you use it, and you give it back. And the mothership gets it. So what does this actually look like? Well, here's some services with down in context that we can play with. So we've got a reservation service here, we've got a catalogue service, we've got an inventory service, we've got our kiosk, etc. This is the couple doing the job they need to do. So if we're talking about how to ask a question, this is where it gets interesting. So how I know, uh, this question we have here is what movie genres are most popular in which geographic locations? Okay. Tough question to ask. So, this is how we do it in Spring XD. So what we're doing here is basically taking sources of information from those services. In this case, we're taking a stream from Rabbit and simply counting on the, the, doing a count of the genre IDs. And then we're tapping into that and aggregating based upon the particular location IDs. So I've basically written two lines of code to produce an ugly yet functional report, which basically can tell us in real time what is going on in the different venues in terms of popularity. So the message there is that there are tools and capabilities to make getting information out of these microservices easy in a holistic sense. Because one of the challenges we often face when we're getting into a new domain is we look at things in a very micro way. Oh, micro, so I use that word. But we look at things in a very micro way. I'm sitting here noodling away on my microservice, forgetting about some of these other functional requirements that have to be delivered. I need to report across my whole system. I need to scale my whole system. I need to be able to update my whole system. How do I do these things? You need to think about this. So, it's been a bit of a whirlwind of 30 minutes, but this is where we've been. Microservices are definitely useful to get you to continuous delivery. If within your organization they're not saying we need to move to continuous delivery, you're going to have a hard time getting microservices. If on the flip side they're saying we want to move this way, we need to move faster, this is a great suggestion as to how to get breaking out of the application. Again, it's less about services and more about composed distributed systems. When you think about it that way, it starts to open your mindset in terms of what some of the challenges are you need to be. You're going to need a platform of some description. Investigate, research, look deeply, you will need a platform. Because everyone who's doing this at scale, successfully, has a platform. Now the challenge we have is there are lots of platforms, because we do lots of things in the IT industry. So my recommendation to you is look for something that is open sourced, well supported, and well developed, and is cloud agnostic. And you're going to have decomposed data governance and recomposed data discovery. This is really important, and this breaks a lot of data, and data um, offices' brains. You are decomposing where data lives. You're giving people control within that service as to how to represent that data and how it's maintained. This may be politically difficult to do. Really and then you're looking at data discovery in that recomposition sense, which again is difficult for people who are used to, I just get someone to create a report on the database and they give me the answer. That's not going to happen in the system. So you do. And that was all I had for you today. Questions? Well, <clears throat> we can see that the highlight is getting a platform. Uh, but I believe that everybody here is, or most of us, are starting a micro microservice store. So if I, if I want to start at some point, I should start with the, with the platform, like can't I just start with some of the concepts and then build up until I need to, okay, maybe I can bring the platform now, or? You certainly, you, you certainly can. I'd suggest in the pilot stage, you certainly can. But once you start entering a production mode, 
and you want to be able to tell someone with some sense of, uh, of, of reliability and, and confidence that this will run appropriately all the time for our business, you'll need a platform of some sort. Because otherwise you'll just create little science experiments that float off in the corner and they'll break. And then people will have a negative view of microservices. So I can tell you, if you deploy that in the practice, oh, well, microservices suck, that work. So you say, but I didn't, I didn't have my load balancing, or I didn't have multi-AC, or I didn't have <coughs> you know, circuit breakers. No, it's your problem, it didn't work. So you need, you need to be giving thought about that. It needs to be part of the business transformation that takes place. Because this is not just a technology transformation, make no mistake, this is a business process transformation. And one of the things you'll need to be selling internally to your business stakeholders is this ability to go into production very quickly. And they'll want to do that reliably, and nine times out of ten, the tooling you'll currently have won't be able to do that. So you'll need to give them some idea of how you use a platform and so on. Um, when you move away from the one big database, you lose um, the benefits of transactions. Um, so, how do we deal with that in a microservice? It's a very good question to which I've seen many answers, none of them fantastic. Um, part of them is to understand what the components of the transaction are. And people will often use you know, XA protocol, etc., to try and string things together. But again, this comes down to this concept of asynchronicity and things not being available. So you need to change the model in terms of how you're representing that transaction. So a, a transaction at the, at the macro level will become multiple little transactions some of which may fail, and you need to make it okay for that to fail. So, let's use the airline example. I may be able to be successful to check into a flight, but for some reason the seat allocation service is not available to me. Now, in a monolithic world, we say, well, roll back, can't do it. You know, in the modern internet era, that's not acceptable. So it may say, yes, you're checked in, but your seat has not yet been allocated. So I agree with you, it's, it's hard, it's not, again, this is this, this no free lunch discussion. One of the reasons why we use databases because it gives us trans, you know, acid transactions and nice and easy. I don't have to think about that stuff anymore. Well, now you yeah. kind of do. But this is one of the challenges of any new architecture and any new approach is if you bring the same thinking you're using before to the new problem domain, it will not go well for you. You have to be prepared to unlearn, relearn and challenge some of your own thinking. And I've seen many people go through that journey just to go to the cloud. It was a big unlearning of, of you know, pets versus cattle analysis, a huge unlearning. This, this will be the same. We'll take some missteps and, and figure things out. You've got to turn some problems on hands. That's a very good question. Other question? It's getting late, everyone wants to go home. Oh. So um, I'm interested in the, the reporting and the data re recomposition. Mm. I've been hearing things around the place around about this concept of data lakes, um, where it appears that rather than pay the normalization tax on the way in, yep. you pay it on the way yeah. out. Yeah. Have you got any? Yeah, so, so data lakes are the, in some ways, the new hotness of data. And they really represent, the, again, this fact that there is no single source of truth. So the idea of the data lake is that you ingest all the data from whichever source in the format and structure in which it arrives. And you land that in that agnostic way. And then what you do subsequently is when you're accessing that data to read it for some particular reason or to do some sort of data science or some sort of analytics, you at that point ETL it essentially, or create whatever transformation you need to represent it the way you want. So what do I mean by that? You can have a Twitter stream come in as just JSON files stored in CSV, and then you can read that in using technologies that will relate and query that with SQL. So you're not giving up the old world, but you're changing the transformation mechanism. And essentially what it is about is that query, is the is schema on read rather than schema on write. And the thinking behind that is saying, we can now afford to store way more data than we ever did before. We don't always know what we're going to do with it. So if I start dropping fields on the way in or ditching stuff, that may not be okay later on. Now some people will say, well, hang on, what about quality control? What about controlling consistency of the data and what if you've got missed records, etc.? Again, in this mode, that's okay. You will either say, I'm okay with that and I will create a 
mechanism or an algorithm that tolerates that, and that's what data science does. You know, time series and missing, etc. They'll extrapolate and do that. Others will say, for, for the purposes we're doing it for, we need to land it in a more traditional way and do that data cleansing as a secondary step. So that the, the concept of the data lake is saying, let's keep everything, let's be able to analyse anything we want and find the right information we need to when we need to. And it comes out of this concept of saying that all applications within the business should be generating a lot of customer data and generating a lot of information. It's not just a typical transactions, it's also behaviours around those transactions and that lets us do some interesting calculations around that. It's a very different model of process here. It's not easy. Any other questions before we done? Okay, awesome. Thanks guys. Right. Thank you so much.